to another episode of Become a Better Man. My name is Tunde Dissu. And thank you once again for taking the time out to be part of tonight's program. We're continuing with the series that we've been doing now. This is about the fourth week, uh, Women Empowerment Series. The initial thought was to just have it for the month of November, and then we had one or two technical hiccups. And also, I felt we still have a lot to cover under that topic. So we're going to run this till probably the end of the year now, just in different aspects of looking at different aspects of women empowerment. And on tonight's program, we have a, a really special guest. I mean, my really special, special guest is with us tonight. And uh, she's just going to really bless all of us. I'm so looking forward to having her on, on the platform. She's, she's just, she's very special to me. Um, but before I bring on our guest, as usual, just want to do some monologue about some of the things I've been thinking, some of the things I've read, some of the things I've heard and, and, and come across in the process of preparing for this whole series. And one of the things that, that has really struck, struck me is the relationship between what the government and the NGOs and the the, the, uh, uh, the third sector and all of that, the, the impact and the efforts they are making to ensure that at least, even if it's just a pretense, but they're doing something with regards to women empowerment. To a, certain, to a large degree, the corporate world seems to, the private sector seems to not be factored into the process, not be included or not be considered as a major part, as, a, as, a, as an integral part of promoting this, this long overdue concept of women empowerment. So while both the government and the non-governmental non -governmental organizations, while they are all doing what they can do, it just seems like the, the private sector, even though they have the capacity, even though they have the, the wherewithal and everything, somehow they're not being factored into the equation. They're not being considered and all of that. But you see, the, the development community must change in our approach. We must change in our thinking. We must change in the way we, we, we tackle this, this issue that is plaguing the, the whole world, really. One of the ways to do that is to drag in, if need be, the private sector into this enclave, into this, this movement of recognizing, of appreciating, of rewarding, and of, of empowering women because they are just, they are as equal as you and I are as men. But the business world must also develop more ambitious agenda, especially on this issue of women empowerment. The corporate world must wake up, must rise up, must grow up, must stand up and be counted so that they don't need anybody or any other organization or any other body or, 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 or someone else to bring them all along. Businesses can be, can be a formidable force. Business can be a formidable force towards achieving this, this all important women empowerment by integrating women's empowerment into their corporate strategy and in the, in the components of their products and the delivery of their services. Because when you look at it, there are facts that are undeniable. There are undeniable facts, <coughs> excuse me, when it comes to women. Because women touch every aspect of business. They are involved in all aspects of business. In fact, a research that was done recently shows that when women spending and their decision-making power, when it increases, the, the whole economy, the whole society, the whole world will benefit. 
tremendously from it because they are, they are, they, 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 their effect will be seen in all the other areas because they, they will spend on household goods, they will spend on their families, they will spend on education, they will spend on, 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 on entertainment, on financial services. They will spend it generally so that the whole, you know what they say, that a rising tide lifts all the boats in the harbor. That is the effect of women being empowered, being strengthened, being encouraged, being allowed to be a major player in the decision making and the, 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 the income generating system of the world. The advancement of women is crucial for any business that wants to grow, that really is intended, intending on growing. You can factor out the women factor. In fact, not just business, anything in life that wants to grow, that wants to develop, that wants to increase, that wants to blossom, and not, must not, should not factor out the woman, the women factor, because they are the, they, 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 they keep the world in motion, as it were. In fact, in another uh, uh, research that was done, it was discovered that where women are in leadership positions in organizations or organizations where women are in leadership positions, they generally outperform their male counterparts by up to 55% in their, in their average company earnings when women are in control. So you can see the, the power of bringing of recognizing, of appreciating, of according women their rightful place and their rightful position when it comes to, to the society and the world as it is. Women empowerment should not be seen as uh, one of those marketing slogans that we, we talk about in, in our corporate boardrooms and, and decision-making colors. No. It should, it should be central, it should be, it should be given the, the priority that it deserves. It requires strategic approach. It requires planning. It requires not just planning, but executing the plan as, as, as well. Once companies have made the decision, if your organization, if your company, if your entity, once you have made the decision to prioritize women empowerment as part of your corporate strategy, then you should define how you are going to support, not just, not just forming a strategy, not just forming a policy, but how are you going to execute it? How are you going to implement it? How are you going to support it? How are you going to promote it? through all of the activities that the organization is involved with. And if I could just point out three critical areas where, where organizations can really put their focus on, and maybe you, your organization is not thinking about it for now. Well, let me give you this free consultation uh, tips. It's free. Number one, you, organizations need to start promoting decent and empowering jobs for women, not the menial and the the whatever is left job. No, the real, the real, real job that will give them not just something to do, but give them a career path that will help them to be able to increase their capacity to contribute, their capacity to, to earn, and their capacity to grow and become all that they, they, they are destined to be. Number two, products and, and, and services must be designed in such a way. Oh, I guess that she's trying to connect. Oh, she's having network issues because she's in Nigeria. Oh, oh, oh. All right, keep trying, please. The designing of the products, the designing of the services, the designing of the marketing, of the promotion, of the research, of the development, in all those things, women's impact, women's 
influence the effect of your service and your product on women should not be an afterthought. It should be part and parcel from the very beginning of launching a, a, a project or the thinking about what to do, how to do, where to go. All of that must actively, it must deliberately incorporate the effect the, the, the part it will play in the life of women because women are unique. Number three, organizations must work with local businesses to integrate women empowerment in, their, in other things they do. It's not just enough for you as a company, as an organization, as an entity, as a government person to, to say your promoting women empowerment, you must also work in, in, in conjunction with others to make sure you hold them accountable as it were, to make sure you follow through with them, to make sure you, you, you question them, you challenge them for them to, be, to, to show and prove how they are empowering the women in their sector, in the areas of gender diversity. In the area of equal pay for equal work, the same work you're doing, the same work she's doing, and yes, she's earning maybe 20, 30 percent less than, than the man. There is no rational justification for it. We must also promote safe and healthy workplace, free of harassment, free of intimidation, free of discrimination for our women. These are some of the things that as an organization, you can do, you should do, you must do. Not just for the sake of the women, but for your sake and the sake of your organization. Because like we said at the beginning, when women are empowered in the decision-making area and also in their ability to earn and, and generate income, everybody is better off for it. Everybody. Women must be given the opportunity for advancement in their careers, not just the, the, start and end as a start as a reception, end as a as a secretary. No, there's room up there. There has to be room. We, if there is not, we create room because there is more that the, that women can bring to the table. There is more they can contribute. There is more they can do really bring the organization and the world and you and I, the stakeholders, the consumers, the suppliers, the producers and the distributors, we all together will be better off when women are empowered to do what they can do. And then we need to start building strategic partnership with other stakeholders and holding your supplier accountable, or putting it as part of the terms of terms and condition of your business transaction with your suppliers, with your your your, your supply chain, as long as it could be, you want to see what are they doing. What is their policy? What are their policies regarding women empowerment? All these are some of the things that as, that as an organization we can do and we should do to be able to actively say. We are promoting women empowerment. Our guest is having some network issue from Nigeria. Oh dear. Let me find out how we're doing. So as you can see, there are so many things that we can do in our, in our individual spaces and in our collective spaces, in our government, in our parastatals, in our lo locality, in our uh, manufacturing floors and in our trading floors, in the boardroom and in, in every other area of our, of our endeavor. There are things that we can do. It is demanded, it is required, it is expected of us to give, the, to give our women the 
room to grow, room to increase, to expand, to voice, to, to not just to be seen, but also to be heard, because it is for all of our good. We all will benefit from it. Lala, how are we doing? Hello. Oh dear. Oh dear. Excuse me. Interesting, Nigeria, we hail thee. While we're waiting for our guests, um, What's interesting, I, the guest you had last week, some of the things that she covered, uh, and the, the, the challenge is for us not just to hear these things, but to start doing something with them, to start putting them into to practice. It's a network issue, she said. Seriously. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll just keep talking on the way we could hopefully bring her on. One in Nigeria will work. So the question I want to ask is in your in your organization, uh, I don't know what what you do for a living, but irrespective of what you do for a living, in your in your organization, in your in your sphere of life, in the things that you do, in the things and the people that you relate to. What are you doing personally, or what can you do in this aspect of empowering the women in your circle, the women in your life, the women in your home, in your work, at work, at church, at play, in the society generally? What are you doing? What can you do personally? Because at the end of the day, we all have to and be counted. We all have a role to play. We all have 
absolutely. There are things that you and I can do on a daily basis to ensure and enhance and promote this development, this empowerment that we're talking about. Because for a long time, I think, not that I think, for a long time, it has it has been a case of, as the old song said, it's a man's world. But that's, that's a lie. It has never been a man's world. The only reason it feels that way is because really men have, we've silenced the women. We've really gagged them. We've, we've, we've trampled on them and walk all over them. I know some of you men there are now thinking, oh, what's wrong with him and this and that. There's nothing wrong with me. This is a realization that I, I, that came to me. And I'm just putting it out there. In your own little way, in your own little corner, what can you do or what are you doing? How are you encouraging? How are you supporting your daughters? How are you helping your, your spouse, your, your aunties, your sister, your mom, and all of them? What are you doing? What are you physically, practically doing to support them or help them? Because whether we like it or not, whether we agree to it or not, ultimately, it is for our own benefit. It is for the benefit of the men that the women are empowered, that the women are allowed and, and encouraged and supported and, and championed to be all that they could be. Because, again, a rising tide it leaves all the boats in the harbor. It will help you and it will help me. So, what can you do? And what are you doing currently in this area, in this aspect? Because it's easy for us to point fingers at the government, to point fingers at the corporate bodies, to point fingers at this and that. But we must start with taking personal responsibility. We must start with, with ensuring <laughs> Sorry, she's saying we should just give her time. We're still here. Yeah, as I was saying, we we have a we have a, a responsibility. We have a response. We have, we, it is incumbent, incumbent upon all of us, whatever we can do, to support the women in our lives, encourage them, to, to, to allow them to blossom and, and grow and expand and become, to create an environment that allows them, that enables them, not allow, because the word allow it means we still hope. Uh, we still have, like, they still need our permission. No, we must uh, create and move out of their ways and just enable them, be an enabler. Be an enabler to them, to be all that they, they could be. Because the way things are going, they, they can't continue that way. This world will, will, will suffer even more. Like we've just found out in, in one of these uh, slides that in organizations where women are in leadership positions, they are outperforming their male counterparts, not by 5%, not by 10 not by 20 almost by 5% generally across the board than they are, they are male counterparts. Now, as a shareholder, as a company owner, as a business owner, as a chairman, as whatever it is you are, an organization, the question is, what would you rather have? Have a man in, in position of leadership and authority just because it's a man, or have some a woman in that position that would not just grow your business, but give you 
a better return on your investment. Because these are some of the things that we, we have to face, we have to contend with, we have to, to look in the mirror and accept that this, so far we've tried the rest. Maybe it's time for us to give the best a chance. I know some of you think I've, I've gone soft. Well, if that's what you call it, well, maybe I have. And maybe you should too. Because it will, it will profit you. It will benefit you. You will be better off for it, ultimately. Oh, I think she's ready. Yeah. Oh, she's here, but we can't see her picture yet. Yeah, Lola, I've added you, but it's connected. Yes, I've added you, but we still can't. We can't see your picture. We know you've you are connected. I've actually just put you live, but can you hear me? Say something. Let's hear your voice at least if we can't see your face. Hello, Lala. All right, can you hear me? No. Hmm. <laughs> oh, she says she she says she can't hear me. That's interesting. Can anybody hear me? Oh, I'm, I've been just talking to myself. You can't see me. You can't see me. You can't hear me. Wow. Rita, can you see me? Can you hear me? Just type something. Let me know if you can hear me or see me. Because Lola says she can't hear me. She can't see me. Can anybody hear me or see me? Yeah. 
Anybody can, can anybody see me or hear me? Or is this not just a, a Lola issue, maybe it's a general one? Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's simply. Oh, there you are, yes! We got you. I now hear you. Oh my days, how are you? I'm fine. I'm doing great. It's so good to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Good day. Well done. Thank you for Thank your you. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank no, you. no, no. Thank you so much. <laughs> now that you're here, uh, let's just let me start by just putting it out there. Lola is my uh, <laughs> <laughs> Your little baby all grown up now. Yeah, she's my, she's my little baby, but she's a big woman now. Um, <laughs> some of you, you've heard me on, on this platform where I've talked about my, my special uncle, uh, my best, or the best of the best uncles, my uncle, Josiah Iriti Awolowo. Uh, he's Lola's dad. Uh, <laughs> we all grew up and all the way back in Makodi and all of that. And I'm so, so proud of what you have become, what you have made of yourself, the achievements the okay. that you are making. Uh, I'm really, really proud of you. Well done. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, I must say, you've also been an inspiration because I remember growing up, like you just said, uh, you were someone we always look forward to seeing, always coming for the holidays. And whenever you came over, you always insisted, what are you reading? What book are you reading? What are you studying? And you used to flog us there. Yeah, you used to flog us. <laughs> but not too bad. But it was really an encouragement way back then that we should take our academics really seriously. And... I must say it has really helped me in my career and in who I am today. It has really, really helped me tremendously. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. I would not want to take more of our time, so I will not try to introduce you. I'll let you introduce yourself while we've got the connection. So please, ladies and gentlemen, let's make welcome Mrs. Omolola Akimbo. Thank you. You're welcome. Please tell us who is Lola. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me on this platform. It is really an opportunity of which I really like to say I'm really grateful um, to be here. Uh, my name is Omolola Akimbo. I am a broadcast journalist. And I've been a broadcast journalist for over 13 years now. And I'm also the CEO of FinSake Media, and it's a diction and elocution consultancy service where we also train young ladies, young people in the media business. And that all has to do with journalism and broadcasting, everything that has to do with the media, both TV and for radio. So... Um, just to, uh, because of our time constraint, I really must apologize. Uh, it was a little bit tricky trying to get the network to cooperate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then um, for journalism, actually, as a woman, as a sister, as a mother, as a wife, it's uh, a job of passion. It's something you, it's not just about knowing what to do. You have to have passion. You have to have intuition. And those are one of the basic things. Now, when you go to school to learn about journalism, it's good. They give you everything you need to know about the media. How do you start? How do you go? For 
me personally, I started with the radio. And radio has the advantages of the fact that it's your voice that carries the life. So most people get to know you from your voice. And then, of course, your face is hidden, so you are only recognized by your voice, which has the advantage. So you get the platform to learn, to build up from there. And then gradually you can move into the TV. But a lot of people do get you know, the TV platform from the first day on, and that is really beautiful. Now, for journalism and broadcasting, one of the things I'd like to just emphasize on is training and schooling. You need to be top-notch to know everything or a little bit of everything. Let me put it that way. You need to know something about everything. You cannot say just because you're in this line, then you would not know something about the other line because everything makes up the news. And the last thing you'll want as a journalist is for your guests to appear much more intelligent than you are. Yes, because you are the mouthpiece of the people out there. You're trying to bring their questions, their ideas, things about them to the limelight. For us here in Africa, Nigeria, I particularly stay in Akure, Ondo State. Every climate is different politically, socially, and in every aspect, every climate is different. So you have to find out what do you have a passion for in media? Personally, I'm more into news and politics. It's a very dicey game over here. It's a, a strenuous game for a woman, for a mother. But then that's my passion. That's it for me, politics and news. But then there's some people whose niche is created in the entertainment world. Now, for you to make a mark or for you to be anyone in your craft, to make a name for yourself, you have to tune in and be good at what you do. For instance, in the news, I keep, I'm in touch with what's going on in the papers, what's going on uh, in the newsstand. I'm in touch. If I get something that I feel is newsworthy, I'm investigating, I'm asking people, I'm talking to the people who are the game makers and the game changers in the game. And access is another thing. It's another major thing. Do not throw away access. Just keep your contacts. You never know who knows someone who you may have to reach in future. So keep your contacts. Keep them steady. Because someone who you may not talk to today may actually be the link to get you to the real facts of your story tomorrow. I'm just trying to crash everything in together. And if, you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're into the entertainment world, you also have to be top-notch in your game. Now, criticism in the journalistic world should not be one-sided. When you criticize or when you're trying to bring out an aspect or you're trying to make things better, do not do that from just the standpoint of what is wrong. You have to balance it. I, I have a boss, a mentor in this, in the journalistic world, in my broadcast life, and uh, his name is Mr. Jide Ogunlui. And there's one thing he will always tell you, balance your news. Don't just be all about what's wrong, what's wrong. Also try and find out the people who can say what can make things right. So let's, for instance, you are into the media, into the entertainment world, and someone releases an album. Uh, that's, that's, that's one thing that we are fighting over here, where people just have enough money, go to the studios, and bam, a record is out. And it's filled with nothing that builds up the younger generation. We grew up with people like uh, Fela, Nicola Kokuti, who whose songs, when you listen to them, rose up something within you and you talk about things you could change. But these days, the, the emphasis is moving away from what change you can bring and it's just going about to things that are not really the concrete things that are going on in the lives of the ordinary people, you know, the citizens out there. So if you're going to criticize this as an entertainment broadcast journalist, you do not just come and say the song is bad, this the song producer, the songwriter, this, this, that, and that's it. No, you have to try to explain, to let the people know what went wrong. 
what could be made right. The same thing with the news. When you bring out a story, especially politics, which is quite dicey, we've finished with the major national elections over here in Nigeria, but then there are some pocket states that will be having their individual elections very soon. So when you bring your guest on, you have to balance. If this government is doing this wrong, what can be done right? Because really everybody knows what's wrong, but most people do not really have the intellect to try and infuse what's right. So these are part of the things that we have to do. And then you have to read. You have to read. I'd like to thank my uncle. He is one of those who really, really infused that spirit of reading in me right from when I was a child. And it followed me up to today. I read. I read extensively. You have to read views from different people. It helps you form your ideas. It helps you form your questions. It helps you direct your part in what questions are really germane, what is important, what isn't really important for now. So these are some of the things that um, you need as a broadcast media person. And another thing I would really like to emphasize on is training. Now, um, for in this part of our world, uh, emphasis, of course, is placed on English language. You need to be very good in English, fluent. But at the same time, I'd like to emphasize if you know there's a certain dialect or a language that you are good at, then practice it and make sure your news or whatever you're doing hunt within that you are good at that language. For instance, I have friends who read the news in Hausa, in Yoruba, in Igbo, over here. That's their niche, that's their craft. And when they read it, they're able to translate what has been written or produced in English language into those indigenous languages and the basis, the person at the lowest grassroots, when they listen to them, actually they look forward to their news than we who are just more into the English aspect. So you have to train, train and train and train. If you're going to be going in a dialect or in a certain language, Make sure you're good at it. Know the proverbs. Use it to spice up what you're saying because I know it's different for every climb over here, especially if you're reading like the Yoruba news. They like just knowing that you don't just give it to them in just playing this happened, that happened. You have to infuse some of the culture into it. If, if, it's, just, if it's a proverb, if it's something, you infuse it into it. It gives life. It makes you an authority that filled and you actually find out that people will begin to look forward to when you come forth to give your package. And um, this is just some of it, a lot of challenges, uh, the challenges we face, um, particularly in this climb, uh, it can get really volatile during some times, like during the political times. Um, but then if you stick to the truth and balance your stories with honesty, You'll be fine. I've been doing this for 13 years, and I must say I thank God and all that. But then if you balance your news and stick to the truth and honesty, and you do not play uh, games of siding with one over the other, you'll be fine. You really will be fine. And I'm still in the broadcast media. I still look forward to more years in it. And there are lots of challenges you face, but you take it a day at a time. And it's a very wonderful profession it is it is a wonderful profession wow so i i wouldn't know if you have some questions um yeah oh, don't worry that. we're gonna get all of that um, okay. thank you so much, uh, for, for giving us all that you see some of the things you you were saying uh, one of the things i uh, I, I just i just like listening to news especially political yeah. news. um if you, you can't be around me and not hear something about politics somewhere in the world there's a politics news somewhere yes. that i am consuming but going back to what you were saying about about being thorough about being being being, being prepared and read and prepare yourself for instance one of my favorite uh, uh 
newscaster on MSNBC is uh, it's Rachel Maddow. And the thing about okay. Rachel is she will she will she will broadcast the same news that every other person is, is talking about. But she has a way of going back in history, find a relic mm. of the past mm. and connect mm. that to where things are right now. But then she will conclude by not just sharing an opinion, not just bringing other guests in, but she would put you in a position where you become a student of that topic itself. Mm. And that for mm. me mm. is very enticing and very captivating and gets me going. Uh, for me, I can listen to Rachel all day, doesn't I don't get bored of her. I wanted <laughs> to go back slightly to something you okay. said about You've been in, in this business for 13 years now. Yes. When I looked at your profile, uh, for instance, on, on LinkedIn and, and on your Facebook and, and all of that, one of the things I noticed that was that you, when you were with uh, Bridge 91.9 FM in Akure, you supervised, yes. you coordinated, you presented, you managed, you did all of that. <laughs> now, yes. <laughs> Considering the, 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 the broad topic that we're dealing with women empowerment, how would mm. what were some of the challenges that you would say you encountered? Not because you are not good at your job, not because you are not you, you are not in an excellent job, but because of your gender. Or are mm. you or would you say you've never <laughs> had issues along the line? Oh, wow. Uh, lots of issues. Um, I remember um, while uh, before I became the head of news and uh, that position, I remember there was a time we had um, a story that was breaking. Uh, there was a riot going on. And, and let me not really say a riot, but um, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding between some students of a certain school here in Akure and the police, and it was going on live here in Akure. And I told my boss then I'd like to go and cover it. And we're like, no, 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 they don't want to send, you know, a female, let a guy go. You know, the guy will be able to go through it because, of course, there were tear gas and things being thrown here and there to disperse the crowd. And, um, like, let him go. And I was like, why can't I go? Like, no, you're female. You probably will not be able to run. And I'm like, I'm a journalist. It doesn't have to be if you're male or female. I'm, first of all, a journalist. It's my job to get the story. Let me go do this. In the end, he allowed me, you know, to go through that. Uh, apart from that, uh, being a woman uh, in journalism has its, it has its perks and it has its disadvantages. But one thing I'll just say is if you know your craft, and you're good, and you know what you do, and you're good at what you do. With time, people will recognize you for what you do. And um, a lot of the harassment will reduce. It won't stop. Let me not lie. It won't stop. Um, sometimes you go do interviews. I'm not going to mention any names here or anything. Yeah. But sometimes you go do interviews, and, uh, and at the end of the day, um, the person you're interviewing after, you know, of course, after the recording has been done and everything, uh, makes an advance. Or the cameras are uh, makes an advance and it can get really uncomfortable. But then if you have your principles, if you have your value system in place, after a while, people know you for who you are. And uh, what gets around... Aside from all that normal, it's, it's, it comes with the terrain, really. But uh, aside from that, balancing family and work can be very challenging. But I always tell people, especially if you're married or you're about to get married, make sure you have a spouse who is on the same platform with you in the sense that they understand your job and what it takes. There's times I've had to leave home at 4 a.m., and I don't get back home until 11, 12 at night. Wow. And yeah, someone has to be at home, especially during the, when, when it's time for politics. And then we're, we, we do all the night vigils because our own system runs a little bit differently here in Nigeria. 
the time that they collate all the results and then they get the final results out before the announcement. Sometimes, like for the presidential election, sometimes it takes 24 hours. And in those 24 hours, 48 hours, I'm there at other studios because you have to monitor. As hmm. the result come out, you have to follow it and give it out to the people because at that point, your major concern is getting out the news first to the people so they know what is going on at the exact time it's going on. So your spouse or whoever you, or if you're, even, you're, if you're still single and with your parents, everyone has to understand what it takes to be in this business because really it is difficult. There are days, I know I, the longest I've gone without seeing my kids at all, not seeing them was three days straight. I didn't see them for three days. So there has to be someone who has your back, who is able to make sure that the home front is going as it should so you can concentrate on your job. So it's, it's a profession that takes all of you. It takes everything you have. Um, we may not be doctors and all that, but then at the end of the day, we, we actually do save lives. Because there are situations and circumstances, yes, where there are sometimes that, especially during the political times, over here can get really volatile. And you give first-hand news, people actually know where to avoid or know how to calm things down, what to do, what not to do. So you really are kind of like the link between the people and your government, especially when it comes to the news side of things. So that's it. You, it's, it's challenging, but then... I enjoy every minute of it. Uh, sometimes I tell people there is no feeling better than sitting at that set and I have that guest and I know I have cornered that guest. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to sit yeah, tell me everything I you have to do. On track. I have cornered that guest. I am getting them to the point where they know they have to dish the truth out to the people. That feeling can never be described in words. Wow. Honestly, it's, it's, it's just it's the accomplishment of everything. So that's it for me. It's, it's my life. It's what I do. And it's what gives me absolute pleasure. Okay. Let me ask you another question. Okay. Firstly, in the... In the, in, in the in the work that you do in, in this line of your of your professional career. Like you rightly said, every job has its every every job, every sphere of life, everything we do in life, it's got its perks and it's got its challenges. And and so it's a it's a case of drawing a balance. Mm. And, but would you say there is there, there is an expectation or there is a demand using your career as, as an example would you say there's an expectation or a demand on a female to almost do twice the same amount of work to put in twice the level of, of work for her to be seen and recognized, appreciated and promoted compared to a man or you would you say it's the same i i would know it's not it's not the same there there is more pressure on you as a female to perform better um most times if um if if you for one reason or the other you are a little bit incapable of doing it there's this thing of oh and you said you could do this and all of a sudden now you want to back up. So it puts more pressure for you to, you know, perform. While as the head of news and uh, programs and presentation at Breeze, as the head of presentation and news at Breeze, yes, there was more pressure to do better than any man who could have sat in that seat. Fortunately for me, at a point, I also had a general manager who ran the station that was female. Okay. Who now? Okay, so it it was more of I understand what you're going through, but hey, funny enough, she demanded more than a hundred percent from me. 
than when I had the meal. But then she always told me something. If you keep giving what you can, you will never amount to anything. And she said, I'm going to push you. I'm going to push you to the point that you will feel like you will break. You will crack. But at that point, that is when you actually get to the point where you know that there is nothing that is impossible for you to achieve. And she did. And I actually found out that I could accomplish much more than I'd already benchmarked for myself. So yes, expectations are more on you as a female to perform more because everybody expects you to just be average or give just a little bit above average. And then when you now show that I can do this thing as well or even better than any man who is sitting in my position. And then there's also your followers. But then, you know, most people have this notion that it's not easy working for a female boss or leader. Yes, it's not. She has a lot on her shoulders. But then at the same time, I also realized something. It cannot be me. I can't be the one doing everything and take all the glory. No. I had a team. I had a team. And that team helped build what I am today. I'm not going to, you know, say everything was built all around me. No. I had a fantastic team that ran with me while I was, you know, there. You know, and they got to understand the passion too because you have to pass this across as a leader. If you come all the time and all you do is just dole out orders, you do this, you do that, and they are not seeing you giving commiserate or even much more effort than you're telling them to dole out, there's a problem. They will just take you as that erratic boss who just <laughs> goes about terrorizing everybody. But when they see you that, oh, you are there, when it's 10, you've not closed. You're waiting for the last bulletin to be edited. When they see that, oh, something is going on in town, you're the first to be there. You're the, the one doing it and they follow you. Mm -hmm. They follow you and they learn. They learn the standards, they learn everything. And at the end, they begin to do things. You don't need to tell them, this is the way I want it. They know you already. Yes, so I they have understand your standard and your, your they, level of expectations yeah. and they rise to that naturally. They rise to it, yeah, and they don't want to disappoint you. So I had a fantastic team that I worked with. And really, they did most of the job. Yes, my name took most of the glory because it was my voice. They had more and all that. But then I had a fantastic team. I would never underestimate that. And all because... You don't have to be the bossy leader. Be the leader who understands, who cares, but who knows this is the job that has to get done, but we need to do it together okay. as a team. Yes, and they will work with you to accomplish that. So really, that was what I helped build, and that was how we worked. Excellent. Now, there is... Um there is a general, uh, let's say, let, let me say the way I've written it down. Is there a mistake, a generalized mistake, in concluding that increased attention to women in media is the same as actual employment of women in the media sector? <laughs> no. It's not the same. Um, Why is that? Well, Men things are changing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 things are changing. And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, sometimes we do run a system where most of the things or things we need to use or work with are owned by other men. But now we are having some females coming into places of power when it comes in the media industry. Like in Nigeria, we have a very powerful media presence in the person of Mo Abudu, who is really showcasing that you're a woman does not stop you from owning your own you know, syndicated uh, uh, TV station and everything. We have people in the blogging media capacity, people like Linda Ikeji, 
who is really showing. Now, few, but then the presence are strong. Yeah. So just employing women to work with you in your establishment or giving them places of authority does not really mean so much as empowerment. Okay. The empowerment actually comes when they begin to own the businesses and they are no longer scared to make their voices known. Let me give you a very typical example. While I ran the news department, there were times where, unfortunately, unfortunately, really, there were times when we had some stories that happened and you expect or you call the women who ran the offices that were in charge to see some of those things, to oversee some of those things. I'm on, I'm on the live broadcast now, so I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cover anybody up. Mm. And it was unfortunate that some women refused to speak with us and would refer us, I'm serious, to junior people in their office saying they can't talk. Let me refer you to this person. He's a man, he'll be able to answer you better. And that hurt. Why? That hurt really well. Because you'd expect, you're in charge. You're the boss in whatever ministry or parasitical that you're running. Why can't you speak? But then you'll find out that, no, I cannot speak without the permission of uh, maybe the commissioner. I cannot speak without the permission of another bigger or even a junior boss who is a man. And sometimes you're like, so are you just there occupying the space, especially when it comes to politics? A lot of women over here do not want to comment or talk about it. But then I believe things are changing. Um, uh, in Ondo State here, we had a female who ran uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, the platform for the governor. You know, she ran, uh, you know, uh, contested as a governorship candidate. We had one in Kogi recently during the, you know, the recent Kogi governorship uh, uh, elections that took place. So gradually, women are beginning to find their voices. It's in little small parties. I am not going to play down our successes. Like I said, people like Linda Ikeji, Mo Abudu, and lots of other women. Uh, a, a lady right now is in charge of the BBC West Africa News Desk. So that is good. That's good news. We're building gradually. It's, it's a process, but I believe very soon the power balance will be. I'm not someone that says, give it because she's a woman. No. Oh, if I, she can I, I, do I, the I, job, I won't, I yeah. won't if she, to that too. Yeah. Uh, if I, she can do the job, then give it to her. Mm. But not because she's just a woman. No. Give it to her because she can do the job. And okay. most likely she has the capacity to even go further. Because she's a woman, she can push extra to make a point, you know. So if she can't do that, and if that is what you're looking for in your establishment, mm. why not? But, but then don't that. just give out the job just because you need to make up your quota on there has to be 30 yeah. females to work with the 50 males. No, give it to her because she has the capacity to deliver. And at the same time, don't deny her the opportunity just because the she's opportunity a woman. to prove, yes, because she's a woman. Give her the opportunity to prove herself too. Yes. Because I believe that is where this women empowerment issue is. People are mm. And I don't mean this about you, but generally, the thought with men is, well, I don't have to give her that position. I don't have to give her that responsibility. I don't have to delegate that to her. I don't have to promote her just because she's a woman. She can't do she's it. She's a woman. At yeah. the same time, yeah. yes, don't can. do it. Say, oh, uh, I, I can't give it to her because she's a woman. If you can't give yeah. it to her because she can't do it, that has this is a different story. Yes. I can't yes. give it to her because she's a woman. And I think no. that's the balance that, that we, we need to, to draw now. Mm. 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 And that's it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, you have to run that by me again. No, no, go ahead. You were about to say something. Okay. No, no, no. I thought you were asking a question. I was yeah, trying I was to going, get. I was going to ask the question. You've been in the 
in the in this career now, like you said, for, for 13 years. There are there are younger girls, young ladies, female out there, even some older ones, that if you are able to get into their into them, you will find out that this is really what they want to do. This is yeah. the career they want to pursue. This is the line they want to, to be lane they want to be in. But for whatever reason, they feel intimidated. They feel I can't do it. They feel there's, a, there's an element of restriction. How did you get into? <laughs> a very funny story. Okay, um, I actually will say this. Uh, broadcasting found me. That's really what I can say. Um, and on the note of feeling inadequate to do things, um, let me just say this out to every young person out there, not just the young ladies, but every young person. Um, don't ever give up on yourself. Don't, don't let situations and circumstances that look difficult right now define who you are. Um, I spent 10 years in the university. Now, you, you're very familiar with how things run over here in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Normally, for the course I went in for, it, would, it should have been a four-year course. But then, unfortunately, um, lots counting? of things happen. <laughs> lots, of <laughs> <laughs> lots of things happen. And um, I ended up spending 10 years in the university. 10 mm. years. Yes, I did 10 years in the university. And, um, w but while I was there, I, I really, this now, this, this is where I, I know a lot of people might find this a little bit corny, but then this is where I give a lot of the kudos to my husband because uh, we met while I was in the university and uh, the latter part of it. And um, he, he was like, you speak well. You speak really well, but you're studying geography. I don't understand. Why didn't you ever go to English department or linguistics or something? And I was like, well, <laughs> at this point in my life, I just wanted to just finish university. If they were going to give me any course, I didn't mind. I just wanted to finish university because my dad was like, you have to have a... You know him, yes. You yeah, know him. Yeah. You know, you have to have a university degree if you're my child. <laughs> and that's it. So, and but he was like, you speak well. So um, during the course of my, towards my last year in the university, there was this uh, documentary. We had had a series of uh, riots in Joss. And uh, the BBC came in conjunction with the British Council and they needed to do a documentary in collaboration with uh, an NGO there in Joss. And I auditioned and I got the part. And I voiced the documentary. And actually that was where the interest in broadcasting and journalism hit I mean, one day to a radio station in the city where I was, I was, and I was like, I'd like to learn. I don't know anything about radio, but I heard I speak fairly well. I would like to learn broadcasting. You don't need to pay me. And they didn't. You don't need to pay me. I want to learn. And I went to work every day for six months, no payment. But I didn't mind. Didn't I was mind. learning. And I learned under the late uh, Rotimi, yeah. I learned under the late Rotimi Kwekutego, and he taught me the ropes. This is how you make your presentation, and, and this is what you do. This is how you get your, you know, your things all set. And for six months, and then I got employed in the same style, and that was where the career started. So. Um, for me, broadcast planned on all my life. I didn't really, although I did admire people. You know, you know my dad. Oh, yeah. You need to watch 
nine o'clock news. It's oh, yeah. in my house. <laughs> so whenever we sat down at all the whole Ruth Benamesia, uh, uh, Mimbolo, Cyril Stova, I loved the way they made their presentation. But I never knew, um, in the course of working, that was when I just knew I actually didn't understand or speak English well. Then you have now have to go for the training. You now have to go for the training. And I started going for trainings, language training. How do you speak English? How do you make presentations? How do you speak? How do you comport yourself? These are all part of the training. And I had to go back to school to learn that, journalism school to learn that. So for me, it was something I walked into, but it's something that has become my love, my passion. And um, I enjoy it. I enjoy it so well. I right now, I'm also, into, <laughs> I'm also into training on diction. And um, yeah, there's a whole... Yes. Yeah. I, I mean... What is the fine sake or fin sake? How do you pronounce it? sake media. Fainsake. Yes, Fainsake Media. Okay, it, um, it is actually a dream born by both my husband and I. It means for your name's sake. Actually, for God's name's sake. Okay, okay for your name's sake. Uh -huh, which was taken from, you know, that verse in the, in the Bible. Okay, yeah. they um, yeah, so for your name's sake, even though I walk and all that. Yeah. So for your name's sake, that's where we got it. And um, it's, a, it's a media outfit. We train people, like I said earlier, we train them to speak right. Now, I've been talking to you for the past couple of minutes, and this is how I speak. Of course, um, I can switch to the pigeon. <laughs> which is our own, you know, you know that's a Nigerian yeah, you know, flavor yeah. of, uh, should I call it our own English, okay? So I can speak to Pigeon. I speak a little bit of Yoruba. Unfortunately, none of Ijebu or Egba. I'm so sorry. But I, then mean, I you speak Yoruba that. and I speak <laughs> We need to have a chat. All your uncle's fault. <laughs> All your uncle's fault. <laughs> so, um, but then um, I realized if I needed to go find broadcasting, I needed to learn the English language. So I went for trainings. I had to go for trainings. Now, there's this debate in Nigeria on speaking with a foreign accent. Everybody has the view on that. And I'm not going to criticize anybody if they want to speak with a foreign accent. If you were born there, if you were raised outside Nigeria, all good and well. Yes, you should speak the way you're comfortable. But I believe in communication that when I'm talking, the next person understands what I'm saying and doesn't have to keep saying pardon. Pardon. Yeah. Now, you, I've been talking to you all day. You've not for once, unless maybe the connection was a little bit bad, you've not for once had to say, repeat what you've said. No. And that's what I believe in. If I go anywhere in any part of the world, this is the way I would speak. I am Nigerian. I was raised here. I was brought up here. Fortunately and unfortunately, it depends on which side of the divide you are. English is my first language because that was what I was raised with. with yeah. Yes. So English is my first language. So that actually took away a lot of the Yoruba, you know, Shia and the rest of them. But then I still had to go for training. Mm -hmm. Because there are lots of words we mispronounce in Nigeria. And a lot of people cover it up with an accent. Okay. I don't have accent. I was raised here. I was born here. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I do 20 years outside of Nigeria, I don't know. But then right now, this is the way I speak. And this is the way I've been communicating for the past 10 years plus. And... This is, this is me. So okay. in my company, we teach people to speak right. So it's actually for your name's sake, speak right. So okay. I teach people, I train them in media. I train them in diction, elocution, fluency, uh, presentation skills, 
how to give that perfect speech. I do, um, uh, I'm a master of ceremony, but then I don't really do weddings. <laughs> I don't really do weddings in Nigeria because uh, there's a way in Nigeria wedding is yes mm -hmm. there's a way we like our weddings to be and i don't really have that i don't think i don't really have that flair but then um i do um corporate meetings i anchor corporate meetings i anchor there are lots of events here in undo state that has had to do with um, the government that i anchor and this is the way i speak so it's it's not about um trying to be someone else is be who you are be true to who you are but speak right speak right and that's my entity yes great i also noticed that you you are an advocate for the disabled i know you've been involved yes. with some of uh, uh, recently, there was the Ondo State Disability Pride yes. Festival. That Pride Festival, had. yes. What's yes. that about? Okay. Um, yes, on the 3rd of, um, of first month of December is actually the World uh, Disability Day. Yeah. And this year had to do with inclusion now, the future is here. That was the theme for this year. Uh, I have a very good friend whose name is Fola Jogun Akilami, and um, she is a Mandela Washington Fellow. She got the scholarship to be trained in the U.S. for a couple of uh, weeks into months, and they got trained on... She's uh, specially abled now. That, that's what we call it here. She's mm -hmm. differently able, specially able. She's a polio survivor, mm -hmm. but she's someone who has not let any of that slow her down in her work. So she actually runs the Differently Able Foundation and in collaboration with the Mandela Washington Fellowship of Nigerian Association, mm. they were able to put together the disability, the Ondo State Disability Pride Parade. And what they were able to do, which I helped when it came to the public relations part, mm. was to stop the people with, who were physically challenged because the norm is to beg government on a day like this they normally will just go to the government of the day and tell you please give us money we're poor we don't have jobs we need help this and this and that and that and that's all that is done but this time around they were able to come together and emphasize and got policies changed that's great in nigeria most of our buildings are not designed for the physically challenged no we have banks we have banks that don't have ramps for wheelchairs yeah we have banks. you know we have uh, not just banks we have schools that will probably not take a child with cerebral palsy so what they did was to emphasize and make like the state house of the on those state house of assembly finally agreed to enforce the the disability rights act that was passed into law by okay. the National Assembly. And now, on the 3rd, they actually decided to employ full measure here in Ondo State. So wow. they were able to take it from the begging aspect to the point where the government was forced to make policy changes. And that is exactly what we want. Part of the inclusion we want is also for children who are physically challenged to be admitted in everyday school. Yeah. Over here, we have a school for the blind, the school for the uh, the hearing impaired, the, uh, the uh, sight impaired. We have different schools for them. But then all the children grow up in their, now I don't want to call it a normal school because there's really nothing like normal school. School is school. But all the children grow up in their schools with this ideology that those children in those schools there's something wrong with them yeah so what we're trying to do now and which the government of the day has actually backed us up is these schools will be upgraded one and even in every school sign language will be taught so every child can communicate with, with 
every child. That's good. Yes, sign language will be taught. Um, Braille will be made available. Braille uh, books will be made available in yeah. our libraries mm -hmm. and everywhere. So people can have access to it and be able to communicate because over here there's a stigma once a child has a physical defect in code. Mm. There's a stigma everybody just puts, okay, you're different, so you have to go to a different school. And a lot of time, even our roads, people don't obey, unfortunately, really, they don't obey zebra crossings over here you see someone with a cane and people are just driving past a zebra crossing people actually jump traffic lights so these are things that we brought to the note and uh, we were so glad the nigerian labor congress was involved um all the uh, physically challenged uh groups were involved yondo state government was involved, other NGOs were involved, and we were able to push across our demands. The understate was able to provide now, not because they were physically challenged, but it's something that we were able to emphasize, but they were able to provide jobs for 30 physically challenged people on the third, which they started wow. immediately, appointments immediately. We got, yes, we got uh, scholarships for children and they're, they'll be going to secondary schools like every other person, you know, at full scholarship until after secondary school, going into university. So these were some of the, uh, you know, things we're able to accomplish on the third. Uh, really, I really must commend for Lajo Kilami on this. She pushed it and she was able to get it through. And um, we look forward to the next couple of months for other changes, especially in the physical environment, to mm -hmm. begin to happen. Yes. Wow. We thought it was just journalism that keeps you away, <laughs> away from the children. Because I noticed when you said, the longest I've been away from my children. And I'm thinking, of the children? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, children. Yes, no, children. No, I have two. Uh, I have two, and uh, they bring so much joy. They yeah. they bring a lot of joy and uh, satisfaction. And the point where you know you're doing something right is when your kids tell you, "When I grow up, I want to be like my mom. I want to be a journalist. You know, I want to be a you journalist, know. not be a broadcaster." And you just know, yes, you're doing something right because it's not easy to fool children. So when they see no. you, forgive you for all the fact that you're not around all the time and they want to be like you, then you're doing something right. Yes, Excellent. you're doing something right. Yeah. Well, Amalala Kimbo, thank you. I mean, it's been... <laughs> This for me is um, it's a it's a time of reflection um, yeah. for us to because I when we started talking about having this for about this event I, I casted my mind back to those days and and then follow <laughs> that through to where we are today I, and I must say. Uh, Uncle's done, and no, Uncle really, Mom has done some excellent, excellent job. And Thank Uncle, you. Thank Uncle you so much. His bit, but just to, <laughs> Mama Shala, thank you, Mom. We really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I'll, I'll, I'll let them know. I'll let them yeah. know. <laughs> no, but thank it's you. been an honor to have you on the platform. Thank you for adding your, your quality, your knowledge, your experience, your journey. Uh, what we're doing here, and I say this all the most of it, nearly every time when I have this program. The essence of this platform is so that at every step we are adding some new things to ourselves. We are getting better. We are adding values. We are putting some new ingredients into the pot because ultimately we are all going to be at a point where we have to deliver, where we have to produce, where we have to manifest, where we have to bring 
change to our environment. And unless we have that, unless we carry those qualities, unless we already imbibe those, those ingredients in us, we won't be able to deliver it. And so yes. for the essence of the platform is there's always room for improvement. But yes. The fact that there's a room is not enough. If you're not filling that room with something that will make you a better person, and your mm. contribution has been very, very helpful. Oh, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you it's so much. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's been great, and uh, I'm looking forward to bringing you back when we can do some more of this, and also maybe when I'm in Nigeria, come and be yes, your guest on, on <laughs> FM for, for your name's sake. No, but thank yes. you and give my warmest regards to Dr. Kimbo and to the I will. girls. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a thank great you for time. Having me. We appreciate Have a great you. night. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate you. Thank wow. you. Well, well, well. There we have it. As you can see, there is so much that's been covered tonight. And I hope you have heard something, you have learned something, you have picked something that you're going to not just use for yourself, but pass on to others around you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with us regarding the network and the connection. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Until then. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.